Hi, I'm Limonus from NGO Nectaros, course developer and facilitator of the MOOC on digital youth work. We just started module two and module two is looking at all the rapid changes happening in society and in particular the digital changes in society. By exploring these changes, we are looking in particular what is happening with youth work, how youth work is changing, how the role of youth worker is changing. In 2020, there was a, a big change. Suddenly, uh, youth work and youth workers could not do activities face-to-face -face with young people. Youth work had to move quite rapidly to online spaces if they wanted to continue still providing some activities. And when I talked to people around who could give a good example how these changes were impacting youth work. Several people directed me, like them to have a conversation with Tracy Moore, who is a service manager at the Youth Work Island Midlands. So perhaps Tracy, now you can introduce yourself uh, briefly and also tell a bit more about your organization, a bit about the scope of youth work in general, the target group, young people you're working with, and then we go more into how you suddenly started changing your youth work services or making them more digital, more online. Hello, uh, Tracy Moore is my name. I'm the service manager with Youth Work Ireland Midlands, which is one of 22 member services of Youth Work Ireland nationally in Ireland. And our organization supports over five and a half thousand young people every year in the Midlands area of Ireland. So we have uh, County Offaly, Westmead and Roscommon, where we have young people in a school and out of school setting that we work with. Many of our projects are targeted with young people who live in disadvantaged areas, many of whom are not in school or who have had a very negative school experience. And those as well who still are in school but come to our projects and our clubs to engage in activities that complement their formal or school experience. We practice many types of youth work, both online, international, in communities, um, education-based, practical, and we have great fun doing that. We have over 60 staff working with us between different schemes and projects and a core group of professionals who have developed over the years to adapt to the needs of these young people. Now, I'd like to ask a bit more, actually, of the recent changes. Suddenly, you had to adapt if you wanted to continue your services. So if you could mention uh, perhaps which services did you start transforming to digital format first? Why exactly these services? Our journey to move to digital youth work actually started a little bit before uh, COVID came to Ireland and impacted our work so much. And this came about from our journey through international youth work under Erasmus Plus. So we had attended many trainings and long-term trainings and seminars under Erasmus Plus around effective digital habits for youth work. And we were also involved in a strategic partnership with uh, three other partner countries, uh, Romania, Norway, Poland, and then Ireland, where we developed a suite of tools for youth workers in the area of 21st century skills for young people and there was a huge digital focus on that so it was our organization's plan to adapt slightly in how we practice and how we can meet young people where they're at so that we can help them with 21st century skills so when COVID came to Ireland back in early March we had to make a slight adjustment in our strategy for the year and that started with our staff so we had a lot of education and awareness development to do for our staff to become digitally competent, which was a surprise to many of them. So while many people would have basic competence using media such as a phone or a tablet or maybe a laptop, in fact, they realized and we realized quite quickly that they didn't have specific skills in certain areas to work online, to meet young people online or to carry out youth work activities online. We spent March, April, May, all the way up until June even, attending to staff development and slowly bringing young people um, online to continue to do youth work activities. What were the challenges you faced first? Two of the biggest challenges for us, one for the staff and one for the young people. I'll start first of all with the staff was confidence in their competence. And while many of them, like I say, could use some media such as 
Microsoft Office or search on the internet or use basic email. In fact, many of them hadn't realized that they had capacity to use many tools and tips and tricks from what they would have learned down through the years. But they weren't confident to go online and try this with young people because they felt it was a slight on their skill set. And here comes the challenge that we had with our young people. There is an assumption that every young person has a phone or a laptop or a, a means of getting online. And in fact, this wasn't the case. We found that this was a huge gap in our community. But while some young people may have had a, a phone or a device, they used it over free Wi-Fi connections that they could access when they came to our project. They more than likely didn't have Wi-Fi at home and they certainly didn't have a phone number. So it was even harder to contact them that way as well. In terms of continuing their education and continuing programs where they didn't have a laptop, that made it very hard to continue with say education and communication skills or to match what they should have been doing in school, which they were able to do with us. So we had to try and source funding to get equipment and hardware to be able to provide them with a temporary fix to this problem. So we scaled it back a little bit and took the opportunity to take on corporate social responsibility through Google. And we took on Google Drive and we set up a whole system online where we could have shared areas for our staff, separate shared areas for our young people. And we spent six to eight weeks training everybody how to use this system with buzz workshops that might have been 40 minutes long, twice a week, that people could come to voluntarily to try out new systems or new tools. And this worked quite well for us in the beginning because it gave a lot of people that first connection with each other online in a setting like this. And even if they could get on their first Zoom call or their first Google Hangouts call, that was an achievement that we celebrated. Because if they could do that with us or with me, the trainer, then they could do that with young people. But that's where they went back to the young people and started engaging that way to have the face-to-face -face connection even if it was online. But then again, they started to learn very quickly where the young people liked to engage. And it wasn't necessarily through these platforms that we were creating. These platforms were probably too professional or too high a level for our young people. So we went back to the originals, Snapchat, Facebook, WhatsApp, even Skype, where some of them had them. And we stayed in an environment where they were comfortable and they were happy to engage. And once that fell into place, we'll say early May, it allowed us to create a weekly presence in a set time for those young people. So we could do quizzes, we could make a safe space to drop in online, and we could start to continue some of the education pieces that were starting to uh, not happen because of their lack of engagement. So it was very challenging for everybody, to be fair. Very challenging for the youth workers who would normally work in this way. Our work here in Ireland is very much led by the legislation in the Youth Work Act that defines youth work as complementary programme of education to their formal school setting, that young people engage voluntarily and that this service is provided mainly by voluntary organisations. But the, the key part of all of that is the relationships that happen between the youth worker and the young person. And when there is a disconnect, whether that is without the face-to-face -face or not be being able to access each other online, that trust and that familiarity and that dependency starts to dilute, starts to go away a little bit. Our youth workers had to put a lot of time and effort into maintaining that contact with the young people, whether it was through text, online, or even going back out to the basics, out into the communities, out into the areas where they lived, and having a presence in person and reminding them that they were available online at a set time at night time as well. Maybe that was their club time. Many of our youth work staff still say that this is very challenging for them seven months on. Some even say it doesn't work. And maybe the mindset, the growth mindset isn't there with everybody. This is natural because we are human and everybody is facing personal and professional challenges with COVID. But in the main, most attempt to maintain some kind of contact with our young people, whether it's in person or online. And we found a way to blend both so that we can continue these projects in these very disadvantaged communities. Yeah, so we looked at some challenges of let's say, infrastructure, of connection, of skills that had to be redeveloped and that there had to be time and space for people to actually learn doing that before before going going to young people that it was about discovery of these new spaces now when you look back at all the 
the recent months what successes could you mention our successes over the last six seven months well we are now a service that is probably 75 percent online in terms of our availability to our service users all of our staff can meet online we have found really efficient ways of working, of collaborating and of being creative. Those are huge pluses for the work we do. Our funders, so the government departments who pay for many of our projects, they have had to also adapt and work this way. And they, they direct a lot of their expectations to us in this manner. And government guidelines are ever changing at the moment. Ireland has just this week planned to go into another lockdown for a period of six weeks. So we now have to take the last six or seven months of what we have learned from that and move very smoothly back into that environment of going solely online to continue meeting with these young people. However, we are very conscious that there are certain young people who we will not be able to engage with online. They will be high need and they will require a face-to-face -face intervention or support. So we are finding safe ways to be able to do that. All of our Home offices and our work offices are now adapted so that we can do both. So if we go to our office to work, we can host a club online there as well. Young people can't come to us. We're starting a really innovative thing at the moment, actually, for our LGBT youth community, where we're going to host a digital youth cafe for them using Zoom. So the welcome room will be for everybody to come, but we will use the breakout rooms then for each of the different identifications within the LGBT community. And that is something we hope to kick off from the end of this month. And that came about as a massive learning and evaluation from what was really challenging over the last couple of months. And if I mentioned that LGBT youth community in particular, they were the ones who struggled most with not having personal contact with the youth worker. And while the youth workers made themselves even more available online and by phone, they learned that those young people in particular needed the contact and the connection in a setting that was safe for them. So we brought them back in a very uh, reduced capacity, but merged it and blended it with an online space as well. We're now teaching those young people digital skills um, and showing them how to develop a space that's just for them. So they're creating a website for their um, project and they're collaborating with other areas in Ireland to develop information leaflets and supports around that. We've brought them along with how we're learning as well, which is a really nice space to be in. What were reactions from young people so far? I mean, what was the dynamic of reactions? Yeah. You know, suddenly they couldn't attend your activities and services and, and they suddenly started seeing youth workers maybe in the space that they were not used to see them there. The young people's reactions were very mixed. At first, it was exciting if they had the technology to engage and those who didn't were quite passive about it and didn't really engage. Um, so let's talk about those who did. They were quite excited to come this route and engage with us that way to show us what they could do. So we learned as much from them as we were trying to educate them in. But it became a space where we had to be very careful. We had to make sure we had uh, or that we maintained child safeguarding policies, that we had boundaries and contracts in place so that young people knew the proper behavior to have online when they engaged with us this way and that they came to a space that operated in the same way that it would if they were meeting face to face. So the same rules around respect and language, attendance and engagement would apply. For those young people who were a little bit more passive about engaging, where we were able to give them access to technology to join us, that took a little bit more time establishing those boundaries in an environment they certainly weren't used to. And them, them using that as a means to contact each other as well, so while it's a positive that they can stay connected, sometimes it's not a positive in how they behave when they learn a new skill. That they, they didn't know the boundaries or, or the rules or the etiquette in coming to groups like this. Use of pictures, trying to explain to a 12-year-old about GDPR just doesn't work. So we have to make sure we practice ethically and that we practice with our quality standards so that their online behavior is learned. And they, they come and engage with us in a way that's suitable. It's still a challenge, I have to say, and will be coming into the winter because we expect that we will be online a little bit more. So we, we just have to stay on top of changes ourselves and continue the, the buzz sessions, the education sessions where we can. And I also mentioned that we have 
training company in-house that delivers training to young people and adult learners. And they have had to make a huge adjustment in how they deliver. So where they normally would have delivered training courses in person, they are now moving that all online. So we're in a space now where I'm educating them and how to use Google Classroom or Jamboard or how to publish a website through the suite of tools that uh, Google Workplace now gives us. So it's continuous learning. It's a very new environment for everybody. But thankfully, when somebody learns how to do something and it looks really good and it's effective, there's a multiplication effect. Much like all of my experience in international youth work, there's a multiplication effect that somebody chose somebody else and that delivers on again then for the young people. So which were the new tools that you were actually using the most? What young people like and what we would use to be effective youth workers can vary greatly. Young people love a quick app on their phone if they're using phones with us. But we have had great fun exploring new tools and tricks over the summer. So some of the ones that have been really good. Flipgrid has been excellent. As with Flipgrid, we can... Um, deliver something small or show something small and get a video response back from the participants. So we had one for young journals. So we wanted young people to be journalists of their own experience of coronavirus. So it was a, a two second intro by video and a link maybe to look at what coronavirus is like in their area. And then they can record 30 second or one minute response to that as a, a, a mobile journalist to tell us what their experience is. We can then collate all of those videos and pull together a version of young people's experience of coronavirus in their area. Another great one I used for adapting training programs to deliver online to our community groups who are supporting young people, especially for child safeguarding and child protection. I used Nearpod and Nearpod is compatible with uh, Google Drive. So I could set up my whole presentation in a really collaborative way using Nearpod to have polls and word clouds and stats and videos and everything. And that was really useful for uh, delivering training online to a group of maybe 16, where they could all interact that way. Two more really cool ones. Uh, Mentimeter, many youth workers know, so that's a great one for getting a really quick response from young people. One or two slides is enough. You want to evaluate how a program went. Um, and one of the most magical things that has happened this year is through what's called Creative Tech Fest. We've done a lot of work in STEAM, the science, tech, engineering, arts and maths. We've done loads of work in this and especially around the visual production, which was a great way for us to evidence our youth work. We had an artist in residence program that ran last year and our young people helped us develop a documentary. So they had a storyboard the film and they helped devise the documentary. They worked alongside the artist. And this year, which was meant to be an in-person event is now becoming a virtual event. The young people became artists in their own right and they wrote original music and developed an album and they entered it into this creative tech fest where we're going to have a virtual gallery of all of their work and we'll have the viora goggles and everything for them it has been captured in some way shape or form and they've been the creators of it or story writers behind it all and they get a great way now of seeing all of their work through this big event that will happen in october how is that changing youth work in general what do you think this you know, rapid push to actually deliver something online or utilize existing tools? Yeah, the, the, the face of youth work probably is changing a little bit. The The relationship part won't change. That is that is the core part of, of how we mentor these young people and how we work with them to help them be the best they can be. If I think to the last two years, how we have developed as an organization, getting involved in projects like Skillet for Youth, strategic partnerships across Europe. It was really about broadening our mindset and allowing ourselves to have a growth mindset in terms of meeting young people where they're at, whether or not they have access to technology. There are 21st century skills they need and working on projects that enable organizations like ours to improve our services to young people. It professionalizes the youth workers but it also allows the youth workers to be flexible enough to learn from the young people as well. And by having that space to learn from young people, we can help guide them to be safe with how they're learning too. Because the online world is it's so vast and it's never secure. 
and showing young people that even we're aware of that can be a big help to them. And again, some of the projects we've worked on, if it's helping youth workers enhance their digital skills, that helps our young people enhance their 21st century skills, which ultimately leads to their employability and their, their progression in later in life, whether that's education or work, or taking on a European Solidarity Corps placement, or even volunteering in their own community. That civic awareness even is a little bit broadened, which is really good. Thank you, Tracy, for sharing your experiences. Thank you, and I look forward to looking more into the course as well and getting my badges. Mm-hmm.